I'm Scott Mason. Welcome to this WRAL special, centered around this race exhibition on display at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh. It approaches race from many directions, including the scientific and historic. And it asks a question that includes many voices in search of an answer. Race. 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 Are we so different? Race impacts our daily lives. It should not be the focus. It should be forgotten. <laughs> This is really fascinating. It brings in everybody to have a really important conversation. Things that we see just in a different light. I see more conflict, hatred, than I've seen in a long time. Getting pulled over because of the color of your skin. The hatred comes out. You know, racism is so deeply ingrained in our history. It's more in our mind. It's something we've created more as a social structure, and there's so much history around that. Have you encountered racism yourself? Of course. You know, why can't I just be a beautiful black woman? I mean, I don't know if racism could fully be eliminated. I hope that it's just gone. Without catastrophic changes in our world, I'm not sure it will happen. It certainly will not happen in my lifetime. And the day they can talk to each other, we will have a bigger hope for race to go away. Race. 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 Race are we so different? This is a state-of-the-art facility. Greensboro. Nanotechnology is the study of things that are really small. Dr. Joseph Graves and his team. Samples for a serial dilution. They study the small. This is where we do our DNA sequencing. But his studies also involve an issue that is very big. There are those who would like to think that differences in skin color or differences in skull shape are also the cause of differences in more complicated behaviors like IQ, like morality, and so forth. What our work shows is that we really can't make those kinds of claims at all. So are you saying that years ago, some people thought, for example, if you had darker skin color, that you had a tendency biologically to be less intelligent than someone with a lighter skin color? Uh, people believed that in the past, and people still believe that today. <laughs> be aware that the world went to war in the 1940s over people who thought that race was genetically inscribed and that certain races deserve to live and other races deserve to die. The Nazis and the Jews. The Jew had to be eliminated because they were genetically inferior and those genes determined their behavior. Adolf Hitler. The Nazi party wanted to eradicate inferior races from Europe. And to do that, he was willing to carry out the most horrendous measures that we've seen in modern history. Now, the real danger, I was going to say, is that there are still people who think this way. It's not that we have institutional racism, it's the fact that African Americans are genetically inferior. That's their argument. Do you find that a scary argument? Well, let's, let's put it this way. I fear nothing other than God. Does ignorance scare you? Ignorance doesn't scare me. What, what I've dedicated my life to do is to eradicate these things. So I, I don't think we move forward by fear. I think we move forward by commitment. My commitment has always been to, to, to help fight for a just world in which people are treated fairly. Dr. Joseph Graves, the first African American to have earned a PhD in evolutionary biology. And that was relatively recently in 1988. Have you had a good career? I think I've had an outstanding career, considering where I started. My mother uh, was born in a sharecropper's cabin. In Brunswick County, Virginia. My father was born in that same county. He landed in Normandy in 1944, came back to a segregated United States. And they taught us to be proud of ourselves, even though we lived in a society that was discriminating against us. Have you experienced any racism? My entire career, I experienced racism. My entire life, I've experienced racism. In, in graduate school, I thought nigger was my second name. They assumed that I was some sort of affirmative action admission, even though when I went to the University of Michigan, I had the highest GRE scores in 
quantitative reasoning of anybody they admitted in that class. So how do you live like that? The way I live is by trying to make the world a better place. He has been part of groundbreaking scientific discoveries. And those changes we can literally read in their genome. Science and race and race. There have been some that say if you're African American, you're naturally a better athlete because it's a biological thing. That's absolute and complete and total nonsense. Who was the most outstanding athlete at those games? Some people would say Usain Bolt, who's Jamaican, but I actually would say it was Michael Phelps. He had more gold medals at the Olympics than any person in history. And Michael Phelps has done it again! The idea that one population of people is innately athletically superior to another group just cannot be supported. What is at the root of racism? The desire by some people to feel like they are better than others and they perpetuate racism precisely to make sure that they retain their dominance of our society. Think there will ever come a day when there is no racism? Well, that depends upon us. Things only get better when we decide to make things better. That future will depend upon what people are willing to do now. But those things will not happen unless we decide to do it. Hi, my name is Dr. Lopez. Is that your sister that invited me to the party? My hair is so crazy, I'll help you. Even if they're different colors, they're still friends and they're still nice to each other. Oh, sure, you can sit with us. You can sit wherever you want to sit. It's not about color, it's about how you act. Instead of Lego, the artist has put let go. To make this all go away. And look at the objects are all in fists. They are powerful and they can fight through, through the pain. For all ages. Think positive, not negative. I think people with light skin and dark skin should get along. Whoa, they're all blue! Part of it is more darker, because that is like something about reverse color or something. I think a painter ran out of brown paint. I've been drawing all my life. Artist William Paul Thomas of Chapel Hill. And I love images. He often paints portraits. Paintings of black and brown people. And white people as well. Completely worthy of our love without them having to do anything. Friends and strangers. People I run into on the street. He sees them with an artist's eyes. Sort of paying homage to this individual by having them like centered on the canvas. White people, black people, black and blue people. A bluish tint uh, that develops on the skin if it is deprived of oxygen. I started thinking conceptually about what that might mean how you might read that metaphor of them having bluish skin. Deprived not only of oxygen. Certain rights being deprived of sense of safety. Her. She looks happy, she looks proud. It might not be written all over them what they're suffering from. Him. Je suis génial. The words are French. Adding in some element that's sort of unexpected. Subtle sophistication. Je suis génial. I am great. I am me. So those are the same men. That's the same men twice. Holding hands. Solidarity. Love. But what does it mean to, to love oneself? Or love one another. White, black, blue. You get to decide what that blue represents to you. The art of William Paul Thomas. Love painting. Whose paintings honor people and acknowledge race. And it is race we all face. think Indians as sports mascots is rude to other people's culture. It's racist. We need to respect all people. 
Change it. Cultures aren't for entertainment. I'm a Washington Redskins fan. I'm proud of my team and its mascot. I wouldn't oppose them changing the Redskins name, but I love it and think it's beautiful and fierce. What is your view of the Confederate flag? A battle flag. A time that was not kind to my people. The removal of monuments is a tricky thing. This is a part of what our ancestors survived. This is a part of our resilient story. I have deep North Carolina roots on both sides of my family. Michelle Lanier, historian, folklorist, founder of the African American Heritage Commission in Raleigh, who fondly remembers the stories of her grandmother. My grandmother was witness to these movements of black history. She told us stories about our ancestors, stories that made us stand up straight. But stories that also made Michelle cringe. And in some ways it is a paradox. The Wilmington race riot. And people were run out of town. Blacks run out of town. In that same year of 1898, that is also the year of the founding of North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance, the largest and oldest black owned insurance company in the world. That is all happening at the same time. We have Black Wall Street, but we also have the Wilmington 10, the Greensboro Massacre. There were the Greensboro sit-ins, which sparked a movement not only nationwide, but influenced the globe when it came to human rights and social justice. So this resistance in the face of oppression, they, they, it's a dance that continues to this day. The paradox of race. What is your view of Thomas Jefferson, who was a slave owner? He was an unapologetic white supremacist, and yet he spoke of equality. The statutes of the South. There is a kind of sadness that I feel that I don't see my people represented. There are voids that need to be filled. We have eight state recognized tribes who are American Indian. Where are their stories? The stories. I became ravenous for the stories of African American resilience, brilliance, innovation, survival, because it was so core to who I am. But how does the story end? It's a complex story. One that in this case ends with a moral. We don't go into our gardens and weed one time and wonder why the weeds come back. It's something that we do all the time. It's a part of the maintenance of humanity. And if we accept it, then we can go about the work gracefully and collectively. That inspires me. That is beautiful. That is a light in the darkness. And I choose to lean toward the light. I am a proud Mexican woman. I do not want your job. I am American and I can speak perfect English. We all want the same thing in life. Let's give those an opportunity to chase the American dream, regardless of where we are born. I am Jewish. Jews are black, white, coffee colored, and more. We are not a race, but a religion. I am a white Southern male that has dated and married a mixed woman. She is half white and black. Me and her both have received hate from both races just because we are together. I am white, African American, and Native American. I regularly hear hate speech directed toward people of color, people that I love. The biggest problem that America has is it, it has never had an honest conversation amongst its people concerning institutional racism. <laughs> Testing, testing, one, two, three, check, check. I got 25 on this one. Tonight is star power. This is a conversation on race tonight. It's a, a panel discussion, community conversation about race. And I plugged in a lot of wires. Testing, check, one, two, three. Put it this way, in terms of race, is the media fair to people of color? So that's really a loaded question, actually. Go, go for it, this is why we're here. Reporters, perhaps, do not think about the imagery of, mm -hmm. of the people that they are interviewing right. and the reporter will pick someone in house shoes and rollers in their hair and there's nothing wrong having rollers in their hair or house shoes on but the problem is we have to think about 
the stereotypes mm. that exist about African Americans, and we have to be aware of how we perpetuate those stereotypes, even if we're not trying to. Poor nutrition, poor housing, incarceration, the wealth disparity, all of those things we've blamed on individuals. You know, you've got to educate your kids better, you've got to feed them better, and that's blaming the victim. When you have a child to come into your classroom and you've already decided this child is a disaster, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They tend to become what they think you think they are. If I've decided uh, that little Jimmy is a waste of my time and, and little Alfred is good, I teach that way. Uh, Jimmy was three down three. Tell him, Alfred, if you're not just like me, I'm the model. There's something wrong with you. Uh, a fair amount of that is subliminal, a fair amount of that is inadvertent, but a good amount of that is inculcated through the fabric of society. This is not an easy conversation to have. Like, race is just, it's not easy. Doing events like this where we have a, a calm discussion is a step, but there's lots and lots and lots of steps that we need to take. Whites with a college education live 15 years longer on average than an individual of color without a high school education in the United States with a lots of differences in health, access to medicine, differences in nutrition, and I think maybe more important than any is just simply the stress of living in a racist society has a toll on the body and that and then ends up getting reflected in almost every disease you can think of. We made race, you know, we invented it, and now it's the genie is out of the bottle, and it's a question of how can we reformate race and really truly be post-racial. We get there, or we, if we don't, we're sunk. We are. I think we're sunk. I mean, I don't think we can have this level of racial inequality and feel good about ourselves. Welcome back to this WREL special that highlights an award-winning exhibition that has come to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh. The goal of race is to foster conversation among races. The more we promote and encourage and facilitate conversation between us, among us, in respectful and civil ways, the more we'll be making progress. Are you treated differently because of your accent? People remark on my accent and they wonder where I'm from. You know, I was born in Egypt in the Suez Canal Zone of British parents. I grew up in England. I emigrated to Canada. I have a French-Canadian wife. I have two children that were born in Saskatchewan and Alberta. And uh, now we live in North Carolina. And, uh, you know, I have relatives in eight countries. I mean, we should celebrate difference and uh, should also be aware of our similarity. So it's a blend, isn't it, between the two? I consider myself to be an ethno-documentarian. A photographer. Well, I've worked everywhere. I've worked in Africa, throughout South America, Brazil. I've worked, of course, in Europe. Close at hand, I work within the communities that are very near to me. North Carolina communities. I find people that I think are visually interesting. <music> Things about their personal spaces that speak to their lives way they relate to the world. Something that we can find some sort of commonality that will bridge the gaps between who we are and who they are. And who is the man who takes their pictures? He is Titus Brooks Higgins of Durham, who sees the people of the world through an unfiltered lens. Because at the core of my work is the concept of otherness. That we realize that they are much closer to us than we imagined. People from different places, of different races. Squarely in front 
of the viewer. There is no hiding. I did a body of work titled Hooded Up, the ubiquitous hoodie. The impression is that they, it, it, it's a negative characteristic. And I created this work that I think is absolutely beautiful about them. The Girl from Haiti. If you move the veil of the tragedies of Haiti, what you find is that they love each other. I think that this image about her beauty is Haiti. Nikki. And I saw her and I just said, I've got to photograph her. Nikki is African-American. And Nikki is albino. One of the most amazing people in the world that I know. What I have learned from Nikki is how to deal with adversity. The world is still there. You can either retreat from it. Or accept it. Accept the world and its tapestry of people. I find the essence of their beauty. All of its people. Oh, I'm very discouraged by the racial climate uh, in America today. And I would hate to leave this earth with this country being in the place that it is in now. What I've learned in doing this kind of work is probably more about myself. It's my way of saying no matter what, I'm not going to let you beat me. Yeah. Is there racial tension between the African American community and police departments? <laughs> <laughs> you can't neglect or ignore the, the history. You're being beaten and, and imprisoned and all of these things that take place and the effects of untreated trauma are just can be catastrophic. Before we met, I mean, real talk, I had a problem right. with what you represent. I mean, that uniform, white male, pretty big white <laughs> male. <laughs> Southern. We've talked about Southern, that before. right? Yep. But after I met you, and we sat down and we broke bread and we really got to know each other. I mean, all of that went away. I can now become the counter to that thought process for you. It's not new. This has been going on for, for generations. Yep. We are just seeing it. We have cameras in these places where these events occur and that trauma is now visible to everybody. I think it's good because it forces everybody to have to address it. And then once you deal with it, you begin to deal with some of that pain and some of that hurt. And that's how it gets better. If you're expecting this young black male to deliver on the stereotype of what you believe he's going to be, now you've made that decision right. that, okay, he's doing something wrong. Right. So it becomes this self-fulfilled prophecy. If you have no level of awareness, then I think this will continue to happen. This is what I believe the good Lord wants me to do. This is my calling. This is what the good Lord has put me on this earth to do. That alone should make you more of my brother than somebody that may look like me, right? right? But is not doing the will of God. Right. If we're followers of Christ, then we need to live like Christ and love like Christ. And that supersedes race. Absolutely, it transcends all of that. That's right. Those that do the will of my father are my mother and my brother. Right. Faith and race, science and race, history and personal experience. I'm Scott Mason, and we hope you've enjoyed this look at the race exhibition at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. It remains in Raleigh through October 22nd and addresses many issues by asking a question and by searching for an answer. Is it possible for us to have a society where racism doesn't exist? I think so. Conversation is the main thing that's gonna make this problem get less. It means being curious about ourselves, curious about the person who looks different than us. And if you allow that to happen, then you can find some commonalities. But those things will not happen unless we decide to do it. We all carry prejudice within us, but through awareness and intention, we can choose to take a kinder path.